Terreno Adriatico, stage six from Apecchio to Carpegna. It does two laps of the Monte Carpegna climb, which I don't think has a quick race record, but Pantani in training, this is his home area, was his home area, a 6K, 10% climb. Apparently has some sort of lethal record on this. But despite it being the queen stage, this long 216K stage finishes with one of the most technical descents in cycling this year. They do it before the last descent as well. So very tricky, steep climb, steep descent. Pogaccio in the ascendancy, I think 10, 12 seconds ahead of Avonapol on GC going into the stage. The others, Vingegaard, Landa, Mass, Port, a fair bit further behind. But had a pretty strong break, Benji, for a man you believe should be going to MSR. Uh, are we talking about Simmons or Aramburu? Because both should be going to MSR. <laughs> but you're, you're right. Quinn Simmons was in the breakaway once again after that strong breakaway on the Belante stage a few days ago. We also had a teammate from Alaphilippe, Honoré Konishev for Bike Exchange, Aramburu with a teammate in his team, Luis Masbonnet. And next to that, Marco Haller buys from Ayolo. And also, Benoit Cosnefoy was in the breakaway here as well. Didn't see it though, because he was dropped by the time I started watching after the Paris Nice stage. But we basically uh, knew that the action was about to start when we hit the Carpenia stage, and the break didn't have too much of a gap at that point in the race. We knew that the breakaway would likely be caught, but one of the riders that survived from that breakaway did actually do a decent job, I'd argue. Alaphilippe was not the last rider that left over. He was like third last or fourth last to drop from that group until two riders were left from that breakaway, which included uh, Simmons and Aramburu. Aramburu in the virtual leader jersey at that point in the race, but unfortunately didn't last too long. And um, he dropped a bit later on the Carpeña climb and Simmons was the lone man ahead. But the peloton at that point is where it's at because they were storming towards the wheel of Simmons and were about to catch him on that climb or just after and uh, in the peloton, UAE was the one pacing. And we saw that Micah was already working relatively early on the climb. Like, we know that the Carpinia climb today starts a bit later than the climbing already starts. Because there's like 5k of decent but not climb climbing yeah. before the Carpinia starts. And then on the Carpinia, we started seeing that the group was already a bit thinned out. And UAE was pushing it with Micah, with Poggy in the wheel, and a uh, third rider, which was uh, Soler, of course. That was also in that wheel. But very early on, one of the uh, top three in GC started having trouble in the peloton. Remco Evenepoel. Yeah, he got dropped when the group was still 25 men deep, when Micah was just setting a steady pace. This is steep. This climb, 10% average, steeper than that in parts. And yeah, he went, he went backwards, which... We'll talk about the whys, what we think about it. It's almost inexplicable getting dropped this early. Um, but, yeah, that's his GC gone. This is the first ascent. There's a technical descent coming up. We know Remco's not going to catch back on if he's 10 seconds behind over the crest. And so that's his GC done all on the second to last climb. Um, yeah, I was... Surprised it was that early, Benji, to be yeah. honest. I thought last Carpeña he'd get smacked by Pagatra and Lando and co. But I was surprised. First ascent. Like, Soler's still there, man. Yeah, it's very early. And we saw that Soler was taking over a bit later when Micah went off the back of the group. And the only real action we had on this climb was that we noticed that well, while a few people, people were dropping off the back, Bahrain was moving towards the front, towards the end of the climb, just after Slayer did some work. And that's a, a thing I didn't really understand, but you described it in chat very uh, properly. What was the issue with what Bahrain tried to do at the end of this climb? Well, Bilbao is the best descender in this race. He's like top five descender in the world, god mode descender. and But he's not the best climber here, not even the best top 10 climber, probably. And Bahrain accelerating shuffled him back and he wanted to attack on the descent. That became clear later. But with Lander and Caruso taking first two wheels, which was, I think, the order of Lander, yeah, he was shuffled back at the top, and you, you can't move up on this descent. Like, this is bike path, narrow. You don't want to go on the edges. There's snow melting on the side, 
or for ice or whatever. And they kind of fucked over Bill Bow. And tactically for Lander, why not have Bill Bow go on the descent? Pagach is not going to risk his life following him. He, I thought he could have got like a minute. That's how technical this descent was. And then you force UAE to chase in the valley. Instead, they get to the like the lower slopes, three, four percent wide road. Bilbao eventually attacks when he can move up, and he's just pacing hard while Soler chases him back, and it doesn't really achieve anything. So, yep, I don't think Bahrain's tactics are, are that great. Always, Benji, I don't think Caruso and Landa make like Pagacha level decisions on the road. Yeah, I agree on that. Today was a an example of that on that Carpeña descent. Completely agree with you on that. And the only thing that that Bilbao move could do is put some pressure on Soler. But the guy had been pacing already in the last climb. If any one of the GC riders goes on this final climb, Soler would likely be the man that is going off the front directly. And we noticed on the last Carpeña starting that Simmons was getting uh, already caught at that point, and he stopped by the side of the road to get like toe warmers on <laughs> which i found quite <laughs> funny like because they they pause the finish line and then go back up the carpenia climb and when the climb started soler was there started pacing again and it really took until bahrain once again started lighting it up on that carpenia climb to get some action in the group but was lander the first one to attack yeah oh no chicone chicone was like yes, how yes. can i make sure i drop as much as possible so he attacked in the face of Fresh Lander and Pagach. <laughs> and he, this is, he used to listen to his friend Betio from last year. He's like, Chicone and race decisions? I don't know about it. Chicone, talented rider. But yeah, that was suicide. And he got popped straight away out the back when Lander accelerated. It got, gave me some Mortarolo 2015 vibes when he was ahead with Contador behind. But it was pretty short lived. Pagachi was in the wheel. He was looking comfortable, cold conditions. And eventually, whilst Lander was accelerating through a hairpin, uh, Pagacha attacked and the group capitulated. And, like, you could just see the – you could visibly see that Lander sit down and be like, fuck, and Pagacha's <laughs> gone. Like, immediately out of sight, race over. Um, who – I didn't even know. I was thinking for a long time, Benji, like, whose responsibility was it to pace out of Vingegaard, Lander, mass port i don't really think anyone's yeah i agree on that they all want to try and get their position that they won and there's not a single rider in that second group that thinks to himself okay if i uh follow pogacar here i can beat him and actually gain time on him yeah. in this terreno adriatico i think they all know they're riding for second and that became very clear when land and yona started complaining against each other <laughs> on the climb next I to know. each other Jonas was complaining against Landa because Landa had been setting something up and then didn't did that attack with then Pogacar countered him and then Landa just stopped doing anything but probably because he was on the limit Jonas probably was somewhat on the limit as well to not follow that Pogacar move but it became very clear that nobody wanted to put the tempo in it or was a little bit off the back I think at the moment that the Pogacar attack went so yeah I don't think he should be responsible for it but he was one of the first riders that went to the front of the group once he caught on and actually started doing some tempo, even though I'd argue that he should be trying to hold on at this point as he was dropped a bit earlier on the climb. But perhaps he wants that gradual tempo ongoing, or he wanted to drop people before we got to the descent, which is also a possibility, I think that, I'd yeah. argue. But uh, yeah, Pogacar instantly got 30, 40 seconds on the climb, even though it kept saying 12 seconds for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty clear it was a, a larger gap because the other ones were just looking at each other and... They actively chose the decision not to chase. They probably could have chased a tiny bit and imploded if they wanted to, but that's not a sensible choice at that point in the race. You know that Pogacar is much better than the rest of the competition. You know you're riding for second. They are deciding to ride for second in this race. And it became very clear that the race was going to be won by one man if he kept up in the descent, because again, that shady descent was upcoming. But did we see some action in the group behind the tax again? Uh, well, oh, I do want to say Pino looked good. Pino was yeah. with Hindley in G3. I thought this is the best he's looked in quite a while. Uh, so that was really nice to see. Um, I, I wish he would go to the Giro instead of the Tour, of course. And Hindley looked okay. Gagenhart was dropped with Remco, I think. But yeah, it was, I really don't know who took too much responsibility pacing behind it. It was Mas. Marcel Neverpool, he's from the school of Valverde. 
Um, <laughs> and Pagacha had like a minute 40 over the top. So stage over. And because his gap is so big, I was like, well, he's not going to push the descent full. Um, yep. So he should be fine. And that's what happened. Eventually, the descent was more of a drama for that chasing group where I think Jonas first and then Landa and Enric Maas crashed in the descent quite hard. Um, he's not a good descender. Neither is Lopez, by the way, who was dropped and was almost in the Remco group, I think. And Port, as we know, is not a good descender. He was so far behind Maas already in the descent that I think he missed the crash. Maybe he was in front of it. He nearly crashed. Both he and Maas were descending on the hoods the whole time. And like your boy who crashed down Rabassa last year, so never again. Um, and Port was distanced. So it was then Lander and Jonas chasing. They did relay quite well. They put 40 seconds back into Pagacha in the false flat descent, but was the stage was gone. Pardon? Are we certain that they gained time or no, do we not think certain. that the motorbike? Benji, it's Italian time gaps. Yeah, but I think the motorbike was uh, not in their group and suddenly their gap popped up again. And I think that's <laughs> how it was. And therefore, the gap was not necessarily 150, but we thought it was 150 because True. the motorbike was with the wrong group. But I'm not certain about that. This is my in full hat. Uh, Benji's got to stop conspiracy. watching. He's paying people on the Carpenia yeah. descent to time it um yeah but yeah benji's right italian time gaps i wouldn't stake my life on them putting too much into pagacha on the flat they were relaying well but pagacha went won the stage yeah at a canter it was two saturdays in a row a solo move winning easily not the most exciting but, uh but dominant nonetheless one minute three ahead of Jonas and lander port in fourth at 134 caruso Fifth, 149 with Hindley and Pino. Then Ciccone with Bill Bow and Aronsman on 223. Aronsman and Bardet, I do want to say, like, good job to those guys on DSM. They rode yeah. professional race. They kept going to the best of their abilities, and now they're sitting uh, 12th and 6th on GC on a stage that didn't suit Aronsman. Yeah. So good for him. And Bardet was actively working for Aronsman here. Yep keeping him with him. And I like seeing that from a rider that is more experienced and therefore is not really having a chance at the GC here. I was already on a bit of a, a gap compared to Adensmann that is supporting a youngster that will need it. And in all honesty, 22 years old, Adensmann is looking really good for one-week GC races, like a Tour de Suisse and so forth, top five, stuff like that in the future. But he needs to step up that tiny bit when it comes to the climbing, in my opinion, to become an actual, like, Top ten, top 10 competitor in a Grand Tour in the future? Uh, Welter, if it's weak in the back end of the top 10, shallow climbs. I think shallow climbs suit him. But, yeah, it's really encouraging today, sort of, because at the end of the day, he, he still lost 223. That's fucking huge, those gaps. Yeah. And the GC here at Toronto in a one-week race, Pagacha first, 152 ahead of second. 152, and we haven't had a mountaintop finish here. Lander third on 233, then Port, Hindley, Aronsman in sixth, Caruso, Pino eighth, Bilbao ninth, tenth, Giacone is on 403. So, now, dominant. What if, what if Roglic is in this race? Do you think he can keep up with Pogacar on this level? On Carpena? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. No problem. I think that he would have been able to hold on longer than any competitor here. I don't know if they would both get over the top together or whether one drops the other. And if one drops the other, I currently lean towards Pogacar towards the top personally based on current form. Has Pogacar ever dropped Roglic on a climb? That's a good question. Don't think he has. I think but it's something for us to talk about later. But yeah. I, I think there's a perception now that Pagacha is so much better at climbing than Roglic. Pagacha is so much better than Roglic at many things, including consistency, including handling, including probably descending consistency. Uh, but pure what's up, Carpena? Not sure about that. Yeah, uh, and but- like when it comes to the descending and so forth, we've seen great descents by Roglic. We've seen good descents by Pogacar. We all, we've also seen weaker descents by Pogacar. Yep. So I've got the feeling that 
comparing these writers is difficult when they're not writing against each other. Having Paris-Nice with Roglic being the stronger writer by quite a bit, in my personal opinion, compared yep. to now here Pogacar at Tireno. I'm just very much looking forward to see what they can do at, I hope, Basque Country. They write together again. I know Jonas is doing it as well for Gumbo, according to his post-race interview, in which he also said that he was on the limit and decided not to follow Pogacar's move. Didn't think about it even, of following right. that move. And I think that's a good decision. But you're right. I think there's this perception that is, oh, Pogacar's unbeatable. And I still need to see that because we don't see Roglic versus Pogacar a lot. I don't think we've seen Roglic in full form in the Tour de France against Pogacar ever because he had that crash two years ago. And last year he had, uh, what was it? Uh, his crash oh, on barely. stage three. So uh, I think that's still to be seen. And I hope that there's competition there because the, that could still spice up the Tour de France a lot if that rivalry is on point. Benji and I, you can tell we're trying to we're trying not to lose hope here. We we want <laughs> you know we want fierce competition, and that's the problem with Paranese and Trino being on at the same time. We have like oh you know the the better climbers in general are at Paranese in terms of depth of field. Simon Yates today is better than anyone else except Pagatra at Trino, in my view. Same with Danny Martinez. Um, and Bernal's injured. But tomorrow's stage in Torino, sprint stage, well, it should be San Benedetto del Tronto, 160Ks, no crosswinds allowed in Italy, and I don't even know which sprinters we have left in this race. Ackerman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, if his team doesn't drop him before the finish line again. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, I don't, I don't know who DNF'd. Uh, Olav Koy, Viviani, Dainese, yeah. Sagan. Yeah. Who you got? And uh, I think that oh, I always I'm always leaning towards youngsters, and I'm always leaning towards Koy because of that. I had the same with uh, was it Decker last year? I had yeah. the same with Ewan when he was a young sprinter back at Bike Exchange, but. I can't keep picking Koi every single time either. So I think I'm going to go for... Uh... Ewan is the easy pick, of course. He's not here, he DNF'd. Pick. Did he DNF? I didn't even know I, that. You think he's going to do Carpena twice? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay. I think I'm going to go for Koi then. Why not? I'm going with Damar. I think he actually looks quite handy. Yeah. Um, I think he can have a bounce back win here. But what Benji and I wanted oh, – and by the way, Pikachu going to win GC. Hot take. Um, <laughs> what Benji and I wanted to talk about was Renko Avenapol's climbing. When you look at his data from races like Brussels Cycling Classic, Druven Corps last year, and this is probably the – me being not – brought up in cycling all the data i look at the watts per kilo on his state away and i'm like well if you just translate that to climbs there shouldn't be a problem at all we saw in 2020 pick on blanco in the welter burgos before his crash his climbing was quite good not spectacular sort of 5.8 for 2025 range but this year benji algarve foyer Oh, no, the, not Algarve, the one before that. Valenciana, the stage he won. Shallow gradient climb, 18, 15-minute effort, won the stage, looked great. The magma climb, Pokemon climb, the gravel one, 18 minutes steeper, got dropped by Vlasov, completely blew up and lost so much time in GC positions. Today, Carpena dropped from a group of 25 on 10%. What do you think is the reason for this? I think that it's a combination of not having ridden against Slovenians yet versus the terrain type and gradients and length of climbs. So, of course, in those earlier races that he did, he's competing against decent competition, but Karapaz in the Tour of Poland is not the level that Karapaz is in a Grand Tour. We know that. Karapaz in February looks weak. We know that every single year. And that doesn't necessarily mean that Karapaz is a bad climber. It just means that he's speaking for different races later in the year. And hopefully it succeeds this year for him because so far it hasn't been looking that amazing. But then we look at the competition he's been up against and every single time I've got like, that is not the level of informed GT competitors, I'd argue. And I think that's one thing because this is the first time he's riding against Pogacar in a stage race, if I recall correctly. So that's one aspect it is. But on the other hand, if you start Carpena and drop after, what was it? Three kilometers, four kilometers? 
Yeah. That's too early, even for Remco Evenepoel. And we look at the types of climbs he did. Valenciana, the one with the gravel and so forth. That is a longer climb with steep gradients. And it seems like that is becoming somewhat of a weakness this year because we've seen Carpeña, also a relatively decently length climb of steep gradients, compared to the ones he's good at, which was that first climb that he won the stage at, was it El Valenciana, the first stage he won? Um, that was a climb that was a steadier gradient. Wasn't that long either, but that steady gradient allows him to use his watts and use his CDA probably even, his low um, body surface against the resistance of the wind and so forth, to have more speed and therefore use his time trial abilities for that aspect. And I think that's where it comes in when it comes to those kind of climbs. And I think that's why those climbs seem to be fit him, fitting him better than these steeper climbs. And then my question is, well, if you look at, what was it, the Lombardia that he was doing good at before he crashed out, Sormano was a very steep climb, but that came after that earlier climb that lies just before it, Paso, the Madonna del Ghisalo. And together, that's relatively long climb, and the last spot is very steep, up to 21%, but that was easier. But then again, he had puncher competition and not necessarily the climbers that we see in World Tour competition. So for every single race that he had so far, there's one thing to say where you can say, that could be it or that could be it. But it's clear that at the moment, he's not a World Tour GC rider in my eyes. As simple as that when it comes to proper mountain stages. And I haven't seen anything that shows me that he can achieve that in the near future because he should be doing better than he did today, quite certainly. I think he's at the wrong race, for starters. He's at the Paranese parkour suit him a lot better. Quick step squad with crosswinds, one mountaintop finish, which averages 7%, and the gaps are not huge at Paranese. Again, I'm surprised they keep sending him to Italy with these extremely technical descents. Um, but anyway, he's at Torino Adriatico with Alaphilippe. It's one of a few things, in my view. First obvious one is he's heavier than people think he is. Like, if a guy is really powerful on the flat and rolling terrain and can drop big guys off his will on the flat and then gets dropped when it's 9 10% earlier than we expect, then he's not 62, 63 kilos. That's yeah. possibility one. Possibility two, uh, the watts on his power meter when he wasn't hiding it on Strava were overrating. Possibility three, but that's unlikely because to run right away from people on Taraba del Pinar, Pinar in Valencia, you still need to be doing good watts. He still won the stage. Possibility three, he has some physiological reason because of the proportions of his body or his muscular balance or whatever that he can't generate the same power on steep gradients and the same way that Lander can't generate any power on a TT bike but is good on steep, Remco is the reverse. That's possibility three. Possibility four is he just hasn't ridden a lot of these steep long climbs against competition and gets demotivated early and he's not used to the ebbs and flow of the group. It could be a combination of all of these things the result in getting getting dropped. That being said, he still finished the stage. Um, like he didn't, but he finished it four minutes down. So after Pots of Evo. So it's, it's never just losing a bit of time, Benji. It's almost like a complete collapse. Same in Valencia. He lost so much time in 800 meters. So I don't know what it is. Maybe you didn't want to take risks on the descent, which I kind of agree with. I think that's probably part of it, but I also think there's the aspect that every single time he drops and every single time that something happens to him, there's this, I don't know if it's perseverance or his response to adversity, where I just isn't what a Pogacar would do, for example. When something goes wrong to Pogacar, he picks it back up and he starts hunting after it. And... A simple example is that part that we spoke about in our previous podcast where Remco Evenpool missed that corner, the response time to something going bad, stuff like that, those small things. And I think that partially also is one of the reasons that 
sometimes he's reacting a bit impulsively if something goes badly. And that could lead to worse results. And I think today it's more of a combination of those ascents like you're mentioning, and perhaps that it's not going the right way. And he's not necessarily the kind of rider where I'm saying, if it doesn't go the right way in the race, I'm going to go absolutely destroy the rest of this climb, even if it costs me every little bit of my energy to try and make sure I don't lose four minutes on the stage. I think there's a there's a combination in all of that. And it, it's not that he's some kind of weak rider, but I think that we start to notice certain patterns when it comes to that. I still think the schedule that Quickstep sent him to is is a well, curious schedule. Um, I'm always, the last couple of years, been surprised by it. I'm not sure. Quickstep are a very good team, very good experience in classics, in hunting stages. Do Quickstep know how to prepare a 22-year-old GC contender to no. be 25, 26? And we don't. So it last year. Yep. They sent a guy that came from an injury instantly to the Giro. Like, that was destined to go wrong at some point. We said it before the Giro, we said yep. it during the Giro, and we noticed it happened towards the end of the Giro. And that's unfortunate because that not only ruins that Giro, but gives the guy the feeling that he probably didn't have a great Giro while coming back from an injury. That was a decent, bloody result, in my opinion. Even if he DNFs in the third week, becoming so decent in the first two weeks is a good performance. And... I think they made a mistake there. I think they make quite a bit of mistakes when it comes to his schedule and when choosing races that fit him as a rider. But I am curious to see what he does at the Hill Classics, though, because I bet you that he's going to attack on Le Redoute, on liege Basson liege like Carapaz did last year, or somewhere where Carapaz attacked last year, and will be that kind of rider where he goes early in LBL while Alaphilippe is the man that stays behind and tries to take it on the final hills. Again, I'm surprised he didn't do Paranese. I see he's doing Swiss. That should really suit him later yeah. in the year. Uh, so he usually has like three TTs in seven stages. Uh, but yeah, we'll wait to see what happens with Remco. Maybe there's an explanation for it. Maybe he's done well. The team and he haven't really said, but Lombardia last year, Olympics road race last year, Algarve steep climb. No. Valenciana steep climb, keep getting confused. And today, the steep climbs, about 15 minutes plus, appear to be his kryptonite. But that's all from Tirreno Adriatico and Paranis today. Thanks, as always, to Zwift. Reminder, when Tirreno Adriatico is done, we have the big Italian monument next Saturday. Milano San Remo, we will be having the LRCP Zwift Watch Along the link is in the description down below to get a seven-day free trial for Zwift if you want to join and try it out and join us for the Milano San Remo watch along before the Chipressa. We're really excited for it. Benji and I will be chatting along with your questions in the Discord link as well. So thanks, as always, to Zwift for supporting the podcast. We will see you with the recap of the last stages of Torino and Paranese tomorrow. Ciao.